Hi everybody. So you might notice I didn't really have a, a flashy title to come up with for this. Because um, honestly, I feel like uh, anything else would kind of take away from the message. Um, tonight's talk that I'm giving is on um, astronomy outreach. And that's something that many of you are probably familiar with because many of you are probably here right now from some sort of astronomy public event. That might have been five weeks ago, that might have been five years ago, or that might have been 50 years ago. <laughs> Most of you probably got into this because you saw someone else with a telescope in some way, or you were dragged to an observatory in the middle of the night by your parents who wanted to give you a cool educational experience, and now you're here. Um, but there's a problem, and that problem is that there's not enough people actually doing astronomy outreach. Today, there are actually a fraction as many people volunteering at public observatories or setting up of their own accord, or even just bringing out their telescope to their friends and family as they're or even the telescopes have never been more cheap and accessible, especially good ones that are powerful enough to show people stuff, um, such as, you know, detail on the planets. And that's for a lot of different reasons. So let's start with, well, why would you do astronomy outreach in the first place? Well, you know, you, you know there's always the classic answer of, you know, hey, you know, it's like I'm doing, being a good citizen, I'm, you know, I'm doing my part and bringing joy to others, but, you know, the more cynical among us need to have a more what's in it for me. So what is in it for me? Well, you get to get people excited about astronomy and space exploration. If you want us to go back to the moon and stay, you should probably do astronomy outreach because most people don't know that the Artemis program has even flown a mission or that it exists. Um, the Constellation program, which was canceled, was more popularized than Artemis even without social media. And even, if, well, even then, only a fraction of people knew about it. It gets other people in the hobby. If you like making friends, if you like making astronomy friends, if you like creating more people who could be your astronomy friends, you might want to do astronomy outreach. Um, you can raise funds so that you can get the club more stuff that you can play with. Or if you set up on your own, let's say, and people give you tips, you can go buy yourself some new beer. And I've certainly done that. And more importantly, I've bought new beer that I can use for public events It's nicer that they paid for. So when they destroy it, I don't feel as bad. No. Not that they do. Most people are very respectful. Um, and, well, another big one, and I just talked to Karen about this, is how many nights are there where you don't want to set up a telescope? Because, oh, there's these thin clouds, or mm, the seeing forecast doesn't look that good, or the moon's full, and I want to look at galaxies. Well, it's, it's still clear. If you can see something, if you can see the moon or a planet through those thin clouds, then you should be out there. I mean, seriously, why not? If you want to become a better observer, if you want to learn how to see more through the eyepiece, you're not only going to get to do it on those once-in-a-lifetime nights, because once-in-a-lifetime nights are once-in-a-lifetime. If you only observe on those, you're not going to know how to effectively see the objects you want to see and get the most out of those experiences. And in addition, once you know how to see stuff through the eyepiece, you can do a better job educating other people on what to see. And um, then, of course, you know, there's networking. You could meet people who are into stuff, into the exact niche of astronomy that you're into. You could meet people who, who do the same job as you do. You could meet people who can become your best friends. I certainly have. Now, um, an important aspect of this too is that a lot of people today are very, very inward looking. And this is despite the availability of the internet and the fact that space exploration is sort of experiencing a renaissance. People today spend a lot of time looking downwards at screens. The night sky is a foreign concept to them, and it's been washed out by light pollution, certainly, but it is still there. People don't know that we're going back to the moon. Most people are completely unaware of the Artemis program even existing. They think NASA is something that existed in the 60s, or even that the moon landing was faked. You have people now who believe astrology is completely real, unironically. And why is that? Well, they've been no, given no reason for the contrary. There's, there's been no one to tell them the moon landings are real because they don't even they don't even believe that's possible because the only technology that they worship now is phones. And it's easy to just say, oh, you know, those kids in their screen, those, you know, it's like, or be like, or be sort of optimistic and say, well, you know, back in my day there were TVs. But in reality, the situation's a little different. And if things don't start to change, we're not going to get to go back to the moon. We're not going to go to Mars. And people aren't going to do anything about light pollution. And eventually, none of us are going to get to look at anything fun in the sky anymore because um, we'll all be lucky to be able to see more than three stars. Because the reality is, if you don't give people a reason to remember this stuff exists, they won't. This isn't just an astronomy problem, by the way. 
Across the board, hobbies are in general are declining, especially things that are hands-on. Today, kids only get into things because of what they're forced to do in school. And a lot of the time, that's very concentrated and often not that useful. And for example, STEM stuff, they like to advertise that there's even now art in it, you know, STEAM and all that. But the reality is that in a lot of cases, it really heavily focuses on things like computer science and not so much you know, engineering. That's hands-on for a lot of different reasons. But if you don't foster interest in that, it's not going to come back, and the problem will only get worse. And we're, of course, competing with a lot of different things now, with getting attention. Um, and this isn't a new problem in society. P.T. Barnum certainly knew about this. John Dobson certainly knew about this when he was trying to do astronomy on the back in the 60s. You know, the reality is we've always been competing for people's time when it comes to getting their attention to get them excited about the night sky. But the reality is that you can still very much do that. There are a lot of ways to get attention. The problem is that not a lot of people understand how you get that first bit going, that first spark of engagement that gets people to come up to the telescope or go to your outreach event. Now, there are a lot of different ways to do this. Unfortunately, the most um, energetic people today are really focusing on methods of astronomy outreach that don't quite work. You see, they sort of view astronomy as something like a rock band, where they need to change with the times and adapt. Um, if you've ever listened to Jefferson Airplane, for instance, and then tried to listen to their later incarnations where they tried to reinvent themselves as Starship, you would know that changing with the times is not usually a good thing for rock bands, and it's not usually a good thing for hobbies either. In astronomy's case, um, the majority of astronomy outreach I see from young people these days is on TikTok. And you might think, well, that's where they all are, right? That's where all the kids are. Everybody's looking at the screens. We might as well jump on them. Let's put Let's put the moon on a screen. You know what? Let's, let's just ditch the eyepieces and have a telescope that live stacks color images of galaxies that they can just stare at when they briefly look up at their phones, look back down on their phones, and look at more galaxies on Instagram and forget that the screen they just looked at was even live. Yeah, that's really going to work. Um, the biggest problem with this whole idea of changing with the times is that the changing with the times typically involves just resembling things that people are already doing to the point that, well, even if you actually get them to a public event and you have them look at the moon on a TV, well, they scroll past space photos on their phones all day if they have the slightest interest in space. Another photo in their face, or a brief TikTok, or someone dancing around and yelling out some really basic Wikipedia science facts, isn't going to stick in their minds. It's great that there are a lot of people who are really trying with this, but the reality is that it's just not very effective because what, 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 what's special about any hobby is that it's different. It's that it's unique. And what's special about astronomy especially is that we get to look at stuff that people, you know, might, you know, we get to show people stuff that they might not have seen in their whole lives. You know, that's another, another world, another galaxy. You know, craters on the surface of the moon. And they don't get that magic if they're scrolling past it or if it's just another display of LCDs it just doesn't stick. And sure, it's better than nothing. There are definitely situations where, say, having the moon be on a big widescreen TV in a public event might be advantageous. There's definitely re reasons you might want to use TikTok to promote a space-related thing. But when that becomes the only area of concentration, when that becomes the only place that people are making an effort, and the traditional methods are abandoned, well, that's how you end up with problems. Now. What are some ways that modern technology does make astronomy outreach and finding community easier? Well, there's forums. They can turn into pretty toxic places pretty quickly. Uh, most of them are. But on the other hand, it's never been easier to find out information on, say, where can I get a good telescope? Or how do I get this thing in my basement to work? Or what's there to see tonight? Or you know, what's the astronomy club nearest to me? You don't have to look through a yellow pages to find out that hack exists. You can just Google astronomy clubs in Arizona or Sierra Vista, and we'll come right up. That's the great thing about this stuff. You don't have to worry about whether or not a telescope you're choosing is the right one for you or a total scam. And you don't have to even trust Amazon reviews because there are dedicated review sites out there. You don't have to wait for Sky and Telescope to review the item you're looking at in their next issue. You don't need to wait. You don't need to worry about limited availability of resources and information. It's all out there. And there's even live chat groups now where you can talk about astronomy stuff in real time or semi-real time, which is really great for things like working on building telescopes where you can even get on a voice call with people on the other side of the planet and observe at the same time, even looking at the same things. I do that pretty often and it's really fun 
especially when you don't have the opportunity to get to a star party that night, but you still want to observe with other people. And that's a lot better than looking at somebody's live stream on Instagram of them holding their phone up to the eyepiece or live stacking with a ZWO camera that costs a couple thousand bucks. But the old ways are very much still there. And one of those is sidewalk astronomy, which is sort of something that for whatever reason just up and died um, some time ago, probably right around when John Dobson himself did. Now, of course, going outside into the public and on the middle of nowhere or in the middle of a crowded street full of people who may or may not be intoxicated or friendly is certainly a risk. I know that firsthand. But it's extremely rewarding and it comes with a lot of benefits. For instance, if it suddenly clears up, you don't have to worry about I didn't schedule an event. You can just plop your telescope down and be ready to go. You don't have to worry about advertising. You don't really have to worry about much of anything other than the safety of yourself and your telescope, which of course are pretty big concerns. But all of that anxiety of getting things set up and ready is kind of just over once you're actually out there. It's done with. You are the advertising. You, your telescope is bizarre looking, hopefully, and stands well above most people, or at least looks absolutely gigantic to their image of a telescope in their minds. And that's really all you need. There's a reason that John Dobson set up a 24-inch F7 that was 20 feet tall. It wasn't because it was needed. It was because it looked cool. And as you can see in this photo, this is one of my telescopes that's painted with what my best friend affectionately calls circus colors. Um, and it certainly stands out, especially when a lot of telescopes are just all black, all white, or wood finished. Um, I'd like to give a brief mention here that hack public nights are really in need of volunteers. And it's important to note that doing astronomy outreach doesn't even necessarily involve knowing how to use a telescope. Um, you don't need to even know what there is in the sky. Sometimes it can be as simple as just helping other people, for example, at Patterson Observatory, with handing out flyers and cards and directing, directing crowds if, it's, if there's a lot of people that night. And you can learn a lot. Again, we have the internet. You can learn enough things to wow the average person in about 10 minutes of reading, even if you're a really slow reader. If you just want to have enough facts off the top of your head to tell people what they're seeing in the eyepiece when they look at Jupiter, you could memorize like three sentences and they'll be blown away. <laughs> because somehow it won't occur to them to just look it up themselves. Um, and so we need help at Patterson Observatory. And unfortunately, I'm kind of far away, so I can't make it. But it's it would be really great if we could get more volunteers consistently. Um, even if you don't know how to operate a telescope or don't want to, there are still things you can help with. And it's pretty low effort and not that often. And you should really consider it. And it'll make you feel good. So please consider it. Um, I mentioned before that telescopes that are big and obnoxious with bright and flashy colors get attention. And so that sort of leads me into, well, what is the best gear for astronomy outreach? Because obviously, not everything works. For instance, if you have a Mead LX200 12-inch that requires a permanent pier and costs about $10,000, that is probably not what you're going to want to use for outreach. Not just because it's expensive and you're worried about people damaging it. That would actually be the least of my concerns. The bigger concern is that when someone asks you, how much does a good telescope like this cost, and you answer $10,000, they will promptly put their heads down, slump their shoulders like this, and walk away feeling defeated because they can't afford that, and neither can most people. Even if they are really wealthy, they're probably not going to splurge on that. If you set up a $100, four and a half inch Dobsonian that you can pick up with one hand, even if maybe you're not going to resolve swirlies in the gray red spot, or um, you know the disk of Uranus with it, well, or show them a color view of the Orion Nebula, it'll amaze them because they're gonna go, wow, I can get one of these and it doesn't seem that complicated. There aren't even any levers or buttons. And that's really the message you wanna send because that's what we're really doing at the end of the day. We're not just trying to get people interested in the night sky, right? We're trying to get them interested and show them, hey, this is something that you can do, that you can be a part of and participate in and you can enjoy on your own time and hey, maybe you should consider getting yourself a telescope and joining us. That is the message that we're trying to send. And so if you remember I mentioned before these electronically assisted telescopes that put stuff on screens perhaps, or these cameras, those can get very expensive very fast and they're also not really good for the money either. Like the Unistellar EV scope uses a camera chip that costs $150 and they sell that thing for $5,000. Uh, it's slightly better than a scam. Um, that again, and again, even if the, you know, the views through it are the views through the eyepiece, because it has a little screen in there, um, it looks like an eyepiece, so you can feel like your ears are there. 
Um, yeah, even if it's amazing, which it isn't, by the way, um, it, uh, it's not gonna wow people when they learn that it costs probably as much as their car, or at least a significant fraction of it. And again, you know, obviously, if you're gonna trot out $5,000 equipment to the masses, um, you should be prepared for the fact that the masses may damage your $5,000 equipment. There is a small chance, but there is a chance. And again, it just kind of sends the wrong message. So I think that's important. And another thing is obviously, you have to have something that's portable. It's way better to have a telescope that you can quickly set up than something that you're fiddling with for half the night, just trying to get the go to line, you're getting pollinated. So in this photo here, this is a scope I had for a while. This is a 12 inch Orion Dobsonian, which would seem kind of bulky and annoying. I lived in a second story apartment when I had this, and I would just put it on a hand truck to roll it to my car and roll it when I set it up. And yes, it's heavy, but what it doesn't have is a lot of complicated assembly uh, parts. You simply put the tube on the rocker, put the lock knobs on, and it's done. And you can just bungee it to the hand truck. It's a lot better than a tripod and a go-to system for a scope that's maybe even a third or a quarter of the size, where it might take you three times as long, even if, yes, you can technically carry it in one or two hands. And um, if it seems simple, it's also going to be more inviting because one thing that I've even had people do is if there's a long line and there's somebody who's really interested and maybe I'm trying to run multiple telescopes, I'll let someone who seems like they might have the inclination to do it adjust the, adjust the point of the scope, let's say, the Dobsonian. Because the reality is that's not very difficult to do. And secondly, it makes people feel a lot better when these are just things that they can mess with and touch and feel like they're not going to break something just by looking through it. That also can lead to them moving the scope off target. But on the flip side, if you don't have go-to, there's no go-to to cause a misalignment with. You can just put it back. So this kind of converges on what scope should I use for outreach? Well, the answer is it should be a Dobsonian because, I mean, it was purpose-built for the sort of thing. It's cheap, it's big, it's usually like three or four parts tops, sometimes two, and uh, you can just plop it down and be set up. There's no leveling, there's no go-to, there's, no, there's Yes, there's collimation, but most good Dobsonians that have tubes probably don't need to be collimated nearly as often as people say, especially if you do it right in the first place. Um, and of course, they get attention because they are these massive cannon looking things and people have no idea what it is and people will instantly walk up to it and go, what is that? And yes, they'll probably think it's a t-shirt cannon and someone will be disappointed if it's not a t-shirt cannon. I have that happen a lot. But, it gets attention and it really excites them when you tell them that it's actually kind of small. Because then they'll go, wait, this is what I could just start out with. I mean, I think you're, and it's this amazing and it's this big and it looks so cool. I mean, what, what could I get if I actually did this? And then you could tell them, oh, well, you know, you could have a 25 entrance to the side of the center track and, you know, you could even build one. That's something you can do too. Um, this, this photo here shows three. I have John Dobson's eight inch there. Um, there's a 3D printed eight inch and then there's an eight inch that I was in somebody's base for that good stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, again, the nice thing about Dobsonians is you bump it, you, some, some idiot tries to stand on it or moves it uh, to the other end of the sky. Yes, it's annoying, but also you can get whatever you were looking at back in 30 seconds or less. Somebody grabs your schmidt cassegrain or your refractor and starts messing with it and it's on the go-to mount. First off, they might damage something just by grabbing it, and secondly, at the minimum, you have to turn it off and do a star line again. But, you know, it's terrible. Um, another thing to consider too with uh, outreach is obviously the telescope's only one component of it. So there are some other things that kind of make it a more uh, fun ex experience for everybody. One of the biggest ones is um, eyepieces that are actually comfortable to look through. This is something a lot of people really don't think about. A lot of people actually will use their worst eyepieces for outreach because they'll be like, oh, I'm gonna use this nine millimeter plaza because it's disposable and it came with my scope and I hate it because I can see my own eyelashes and nothing else. Yeah, if you hate it, think about someone who's never looked through a telescope for the first time that's gonna have trouble lining their eye up with an eyepiece that's a lot comfier. Don't do that. Nice long eye relief eyepieces aren't that expensive. You can get one for like $50. You can get a zoom that's got decent eye relief. I don't love zooms, but some people do. I mean, it does remove the swapping them out process. Focusing. But um, a long eye relief eyepiece that's comfortable to look through can make the difference between seeing anything at all for a lot of people because you have no idea how many people are going to say that they saw something to be polite. That's most of them. Like, especially when my favorite is people buff the scope and then say they saw something. No, they didn't. I know that, like, I'm like, I know you didn't. You moved it before you even looked through it. Some people look through it and then they move it. But 
No, you send, so in, when it's something like an eyepiece where they can't physically get their eye close enough, or alternatively, they're afraid to take off their glasses, they're afraid to actually touch it, something like that, well, don't use an eyepiece that's gonna be impossible for them to see anything through. Also, if you use an eyepiece that's got a wide angle and that's sharp out to the edge and has long eye relief, stuff's gonna stay in the field of view longer. If they slightly bump it, it's not a big deal. If they don't know where to look in the field of view, that's fine. And if you're looking at the moon, it's more immersive. So it's kind of just a win all around. Um, another thing to have that's really important, and we have them for Hack, I have some myself, are business cards. Because people today, obviously, you know, they'll be like, oh, well, they can just follow my Instagram. They won't. People will look at it. They might even take a picture if you put a sticker of your Instagram handle or write down your phone number or something, but they'll either forget what it was for or just it just won't stay in their minds. Whereas if you hand them one of these, this is a physical thing that tells them, okay, here's the info and who or what is it? And that's a lot harder for them to confuse or, or forget about than just you know a written down number or email address or a social media tag, because without context, that will be meaningless. Um, and um, some other things too are eyepiece wipes. A lot of people are really concerned about gunk getting on their eyepieces from doing outreach. Yeah, it's gonna happen. Somebody's gonna have mascara and they're gonna jam their face into it. Big deal. Eyepieces are actually pretty resilient and uh, you can get a bucket of Zeiss wipes for like $20 and have 500 of them and that might last you like three years because that's about how long mine did and I do outreach pretty much every week. So not an expensive investment. If you're really concerned about your gear being stolen um, or somebody just picking up something that's not theirs by mistake, just put some air tags, they're cheap. Um, and uh, another thing that people uh, like to really obsess over for outreach is, well, what am I gonna show people? Because sometimes you know you have a night where it's not where you have a public event or it's just not very good and so you feel like doing outreach because you don't feel like it's there, which is fine too, as I said. And they're like, well, what do I, what do I look at? Like, you know, what, what do I show people? So I've kind of created this cool little rankings list here just to give you an idea of some stuff you can see and what's needed for it. Um, one of the big things to keep in mind is that um, some stuff's gonna be more interesting to people because of what it is, obviously, than what it looks like. But on the other hand, having them be able to see it at all is kind of the minimum bar you wanna aim for. Uh, yeah, some people are gonna be unimpressed by this galaxy being a faint fuzzy, but they're gonna be a lot more unimpressed if they just literally cannot see it because it just requires better dark adaptation than they currently have. So um, I think my favorite my favorite things to show people are usually star clusters and obviously the moon's planets. But you know, there's some other stuff you can show them too. And um, also you have to keep in mind, 89% uh, of nights have at least one planet or the moon up, statistically speaking. I wrote for sidewalk astronomy here because if you're doing sidewalk astronomy, any deep sky objects are gonna be out. You might get an open cluster. I guess there's doubles. I hate doubles. I don't I don't think anyone has any excitement about looking at doubles when I set up for sidewalk astronomy at all. Mostly because they don't know what it is. Um, a lot of people don't know what Jupiter is either, but at least that's a big bright ball in the eyepiece with little dots around it. Like they can they can figure that out. Their aim sounds cool. Tell them to come look at a double star or something in Arabic, no. Um, they'll probably think you're recruiting them for something. Um, Luckily, that's not a problem. Again, 89% of the time, approximately, you're gonna have a moon, an interesting planet, or both, high enough to be observed. And uh, the other 11% are usually clumped around a small part of the year, and also uh, there's this thing called weather and clouds, so you probably don't even have to worry about that little 11% because that little 11% might contain like one night in the whole year, or something. And you could just set up somewhere that's not as light polluted or at least flat to that glare, and then you could after open clusters or doubles. And then there's always like Uranus, Neptune, and Mercury, which are pretty uninteresting and often hard to resolve with anything, but you can at least say, hey, that's a planet. Uh, there's also Ceres and Vesta. There's also other asteroids. Um, of course, that kind of falls under the same category as double stars, and people have no idea what it is. It doesn't have a name, and it's gonna look like a point. But it's not shit. Um, Another thing to consider too, if you're considering running your own event or you're running an event with a group for the first time or whatever, or you've just been put in charge of something, or maybe you've just even got family members over and somebody brought an extra telescope that they're coming out of you. Well, how do you prioritize what you're gonna look at? And one of the big things is that you really wanna, you really wanna think about what telescope is best for what, and so that usually involves, you know, 
thinking about, okay, so what targets are gonna be good for small averages and so forth. Um, another situation you might find yourself in is maybe the, you have access to two telescopes and one of them has tracking. Or maybe both of them have tracking. Um, if you can physically set both of them up, you can probably run two telescopes, provided at least one has tracking. Just like stick the one with tracking on the moon, hope nobody moves it or messes with it for too long, and just keep it within roughly arm's reach ish so you can run over and fix it, and you can probably run two telescopes at once. I've done it a lot because sometimes, you know, when you have the moon and say Jupiter and Saturn up, you really want to have two telescopes, and sometimes you might not have a second person, and that's okay. Again, if you have one that has tracking, you can probably still manage it. It's a little stressful. But um, I think it's really rewarding to do, and you know that way you don't have to also keep switching one scope between targets, which can often take more time than just occasionally having to go and fix the other one. Um, I've got plenty of experience doing that. Again, not ideal, but it works. Um, and uh, that's really all I have to really uh, talk about. Um, again, I think that a lot of people kind of underestimate, you know, how many other people out there are doing astronomy outreach? Because you know you hear about public nights at the observatory, you hear about you know this group doing the such and such. But you have to remember that just because there's a scheduled public night doesn't mean there's enough volunteers. Just because, and just because there's a scheduled public night doesn't mean it's going to be clear. And um, one of the most important aspects of all this is, and I, I probably mentioned it earlier, is even if you have the best equipment and observatory or whatever possible, it's not in the right place. People aren't going to know about it. Just because people can find out about a hack doesn't mean they're going to know about it. That's why having the cards, that's why setting up for people you know, setting up maybe necessarily on your own time in a public place is really important because you're going to reach people you're never going to otherwise see what there, what there was to see or even know that this is a hobby that they can do or any of that because with all the information in the world available, it still requires people have the inclination to seek it out. There's more information out there than ever. There's more telescopes out there than ever. There's more books out there on astronomy than ever. There's more, club, there's, there's more clubs out there than ever. There's more online communities. But it doesn't matter because if people are overloaded with all that other information, they're going to go from all this other stuff going on in their lives and they don't have it shoved in their face in front of them, they're not gonna know about it. So it's really important to spread the message and sometimes and sometimes that can mean, you know, maybe maybe some more unconventional things like doing a star party in the middle of a sidewalk or a beach. And that's fine. It it's all about getting out there making the effort. And that doesn't mean you necessarily know everything. I certainly don't. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you have the best telescope, though if you have one that's really bad and can be really hard to aim and it's gonna frustrate you, maybe don't set that up for other people. Um, otherwise, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter if you have a pair of tripod-mounted binoculars at 10 power and you can see the moons of Jupiter for it. I mean, with it, you know, it, that's, that's something. You can set that up for people who have a good time. Half of it's just being able to have the showmanship to say, hey, this is, you know, I've got this telescope, I've got these binoculars, we're looking at Jupiter, the dots around it are its moons, did you know these were the first thing that Galileo discovered? And all of them are around the size of our moon or bigger, and two of them are bigger than the planet Mercury. That's it. If you know that, you can sell that, you can say it slightly more enthusiastically than I just did. <laughs> you can sell people on astronomy, and you can get them hooked for a lifetime, or at the very least, the next time that they hear about some NASA thing, or a SpaceX launch, or whatever, they might go and tune in and watch it. Or they might see a thing about hack, and they might come to a public night, and then they might join. You know, you never know. It's all about planting that spark of interest in the first place, and that's what doing astronomy outreach is ultimately all about. Thank you. So Zay, you talked about eyepieces, and you know that's kind of a wide subject. So. What's your recommendation on what, what do you consider a, you know, a wide angle and what are the best focal lengths for the eyepieces? Well, so the focal length of the eyepiece really depends on what scope you're going with. So um, I'd say for, for, from my experience, um, generally the ideal power for Jupiter and Saturn um, is usually between about 80 to 120. So whatever eyepiece can produce that. For the moon, it really doesn't matter. Um, and it really just comes down to what your telescope's capable of. One of the things, um, I don't know if I cut it out of the presentation or not, is um, exit people. If you're using a small scope at high power, that little dot of light coming out of it is gonna be really tiny, and that's hard for people to line their eyes up with. So if you're using a smaller scope, you wanna keep the power more limited. Also, again, like shakiness and mountain stuff too. Um, and of course, seeing. But generally, I think no, no more than about 30 power per inch of aperture ever for outreach. Try to stay around 20 per inch at max. 
Um, and that corresponds to an exit pupil of, I think, like something like no smaller than two millimeters. I find smaller than about two, three millimeter exit pupil is hard. Obviously, the other end making it too big um, might not be good for some deep sky objects. But generally, that's less of a problem than the too small one. Um, as for wide angle, um, I really just define wide angle as anything 60 degrees or more. You do not need to use an ethos. I will say, people really love it when you do use an ethos. It's amazing. It is a mind blowing experience. Um, and there are ethos knockoffs that you can get for like $200. Um, one of my favorite eyepiece lines to use is um, the Cunning United Optics. They're linked to in my little AliExpress thing down there. Um, or Angel Eyes, 82 degrees. They're basically Nagler phones and they're like $80 or $90. Need ultra wide angles, uh, Stellar View, Teleview, of course. Um, anything, and anything in more than about 15 millimeters of eye relief is probably ideal. Um, and, um, you know, the, the number one thing is, you know, you want to balance, obviously, how expensive an eyepiece it is with, you know, um, what kind of capabilities you're getting. And, you know, obviously, if you're using a slow, smaller scope, you're going to be able to get away with cheaper wide-angle designs that will be sharp. And, but generally speaking, like, my favorites, if you're not going to go on AliExpress, would be um, the, there's these, like, BST, TMB planetaries on Amazon that are, like, $30 deep. Gold line eyepieces are pretty good too, and red line, they're the same. They're all like Urfuls or far low Urfuls. The Agena Star Guiders and Astrotech Paradigms are pretty good. Anything from like any of the Botter, Morpheus, Hyperion, you know, a lot of the Explore Scientific Television stuff. Um, there's some other options out there, but really you just want to look for any eyepiece line that kind of has like big eye lenses throughout the whole set of eyepieces. That's going to generally coincide with long eye relief, so that right there is really the, the, easiest, the easiest thing to look for. And again, you know, I'd say. 80 to 120, maybe 160 power for plants. If you can push it more, and you either have tracking or a really wide angle eyepiece, and the scene is going to let you, that's great. And the scope is going to be big enough to let you do that. That's great, but you know, people will complain it's too small if it's below about 80 power. Below about 60, like Saturn and Jupiter, it's hard for them to see anything. Mars, you need about 80 to 100. Mars, you really need about 100. Um, and you know, Moon, again, Moon is going to be impressive at 20 power. People can see craters. They're not looking to see, you know, Hadleyville or craterlets in Plato. Though, you know, if you tell them what they're looking at and they do get to see that, that can be really fun. You know, the conditions have to support it and so forth. Um, and again, deep sky objects, you know, it just comes down to the object conditions in that case. You're doing sidewalk recruiting, if you will. It looked like you set those telescopes up. You had an image of three telescopes yep. on the sidewalk right under a street light. So what are they going to see? Planets. Planets don't care. You can see, you know, you can actually see Jupiter and Venus in broad daylight if you know where to look. The planets really, really aren't affected by light pollution. The only thing you're going to do that's going to happen is the moons of Saturn are going to go away. And the moons of Uranus and Neptune are hard to see in the first place. But, you know, other than that, it does not matter in any way, shape, or form. You can see the Galilean moons standing under a streetlight with a pair of binoculars. The planet's details are not going to be any different. There's always the moon. Double stars, again, really hard to wash out a bright double star running from like magnitude 10, even in a small scope. Um, open clusters, you'd be surprised how resilient they are with light pollution too, because again, they're point sources, same with globulars. Um, I mean, I, right under that street light, I can still see the Orion Nebula. It's granted, it's gonna, it looks about as good as through like a three inch under, not directly under a street lamp skies, but you can still see the nebulosity in an eight, and that's pretty good. Um, but you know, moon, planets, double star, again, those are the easiest things for people to see anyways. You, have pe you can have people at a Portal 1 site and look at a have them look at a galaxy in a 16-inch and be really unimpressed, even if their dust lanes of Andromeda are right there. You know, I've, I've, had a lot of, you know, I've had a lot of friends who are new to the hobby, and I take them out to a Portal 2 site, and I show them galaxies or globulars, and they're like, what? So, you know, it, you know yes, you're going to lose deep sky objects in a light place, but that's where people are, and ultimately, again, you're not going to be showing the deep sky stuff for the most part. Get them hooked with the planets, and then you can get them out to the dark skies and show them how to look through the telescope and get them into looking at deep sky stuff. It's about the engagement. So yes, it's going to limit your targets, but on the other hand, that's what works. But you're setting up in the vicinity of a college campus where there's a steady flow of people. Yeah, but you can set up, I mean, anywhere that there's a steady flow of people is going to work. And you don't have to set up with a steady flow of people. If you just want to set up in front of a restaurant or a strip mall or something that's got a handful of people going through it, you'll probably at least you know, even if you only reach one person, you don't know who that one person is. That one person could decide, hey, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna go start a company, or I'm you know it could be a kid. They could become an engineer who invents some 
brilliant device or discover some new particle or become, they become an astronaut. You don't know who that one person is going to be. So that's what I always say to people who are new to it. Start with one person. If you can get one person even excited enough that they remember it, you don't know. They could go and, you know, maybe that one person doesn't, nothing in their life changes, but they tell someone else about it and that other person gets into it. You might never meet the other person, that, that other person. They could be on the other side of the planet for all you know. But you don't know what you're going to do with just even one. If you get one person's attention, attention, if you get them to think about it enough that they either remember it or talk about it, you don't know where that's going to go. Yes, most of us are of the age where we don't have our face in the phones all the time. So what is that icon up there in the upper right of the face? <laughs> that's Discord. It's, a, um, Discord, it's right. actually really easy to use. It's kind of like IRC, if you've heard of that. It's a live chatting app that you can have on your PC or your phone or tablet. And there's a big group there, that's what the link is to, is um, Observational Astronomy. It's a, it's a group I'm part of. And one of the really fun things, one of the, some of the fun things we have in Observational Astronomy are we have these things called quests where we have observing challenges for people to do where they can write log stuff and go for a certain not go for objects and talk about what they see. We have um, virtual star parties where people get on and they just put their phone on a speaker and they turn the screen off, and then you can sit there and look at the eyepiece and yap away at people while you're looking at stuff in the eye, through the eyepiece. Another thing we have on observational astronomy is we have a telescope making um, uh, chat. You have different little threads. It's like a forum. It's like what we use for Hack with real time. And we have a telescope making chat. And when I started on there, there was no other telescope maker on observational astronomy. There were no other telescope makers my age, period, anywhere. Um, and now there are um, a few hundred. Um, we, developed a we developed a 3D printed telescope on there, um, and that's been made by thousands of people. Um, that there are thousands of people making their own telescopes, because we sat there on there and we sketched, and some people worked in CAD, and we really it's the genius of one guy, I met Jonathan Kisner. But we, together, worked with him on developing a 3D printed telescope, and we helped sort of sell it to other people. And then I start, you know, I posted my mirror making stuff and whatnot, and now there are dozens of people posting on there about grinding mirrors that might be as large as 20 inches. They're building telescopes, they're 3D printing stuff. We have hundreds of people posting observing logs, and it's it's a real it's really great and it's a really exciting thing. We have, there's also Reddit. Reddit has some astronomy communities that I sort of got famous on there. I posted um, a photo of my 14-inch telescope during the height of COVID. It got a quarter million upvotes. I think there were some people who were saying there, I got like messages from president from presidential staffers showing saying they had like shown the VP in or something. Uh, it was seen by something like 10 million people, and it caused a lot of people to join the Observational Astronomy Discord and pick up telescope making. And that's why the guy I, I helped with the 3D printed one got into it. Um, again, you know, social media isn't everything, but it can definitely expand something if you already have something good. You just can't, you can't only have that in front of it, is, is sort of the thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, I did something maybe 15 years ago. <clears throat> I go to Rocky Point a lot, and what I do is I sit out on the, on the deck, it's really dark down there, and I had my binoculars, and I was looking at, at the stars. So then the neighbors came over, and then these neighbors came over. And so now, whenever we go down to this particular house, first, all the kids, we all sit out there for like an hour and count satellites, okay? And then, <clears throat> then all the older people bring out binoculars, or just lay there and look at the star and they go, oh, what is that? Is that Orion? And we have like maybe 50 people now that when we come down there, they come over and, and look at the sky before they never did. That's fantastic. And that really just goes to show again, it's not necessarily about what equipment you use or where yeah. you do it. It's about having the creativity to set out and try to get other people interested in the first place. You know. Yeah. You could, you know, you, there are ways you can do astronomy outreach without a telescope or binoculars or any equipment at all. You know, you could have, you, you know, you could, one, one thing that happened to me one time was I was standing out, I was going, I actually had the telescope set up, but there was a SpaceX Falcon 9 launch from Vandenberg, and we had the trail over there, and I got, I just started, I just sat there, I just stood there and started talking, and just yelling about what it was, trying to explain it over all the music and everything, and, you know, there were, you know, there were hundreds of people who had no idea what that was, and, they got to find out what it was, and some of them went home and were posted. And it was, it was, and you know, otherwise they were just going, "Oh, it was a UFO or a plane." You know, that you know, you can you can get you can you can get people interested. You can be a useful resource, even without any equipment at all. If you want, if you have that.
have the opportunity. Thank you, Zane. I, I appreciate that because this is something that we keep pressing is to have people in the outreach. As he said, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to have a telescope. Just you just have initiative. to come and be part of it. And we get a lot of kids that we see during the day that come for their school groups and we work with them, show them around the observatory, show them the, the big telescope, and they drag their parents back for a public night because they are so jazzed about what they could see. So we encourage you, and, and you gave us some really, really good information. I appreciate that, Zane. It's nice to have somebody else put out the word for us, and I encourage you to participate in the outreach, we will have those those opportunities this this year, lots of them. But the date, uh, and uh, we'd like you to all um, be part of the pro process. Now, you had an acronym on there. You go, you were a slides forward that I didn't recognize. Keep going, one more. There. What is DSO? Deep sky objects. Ah, thank you. See. It's always a challenge to form a I've heard points. something new. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.